Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I do have a feeling that most people who are viewing this video are not my current subscribers because this video content is very different than the other content on my page. Well, kinda. I am a music festival vlogger, so I travel the world going to different music festivals to make vlogs, reviews, and tip videos about them. So yeah, I do these helpful review and tip videos for music festivals, and then I attended the Sundance Film Festival. I just thought I could do something similar to help people out. Cause yeah, I realized there really aren't like any tip videos about Sundance on YouTube and now there are so first off I do want to let you guys know that there are timestamps to each topic in the description in case you're looking for some specific information or a specific question to be answered disclaimer I am by no means an expert this previous Sundance was my first year so I made a lot of mistakes and I learned a lot I was a film student at the time so I did attend with the Sundance student ignite package thing yeah i did vlog my experience if you want to check it out i will link to those vlogs in the description a quick overview about the sundance film festival is that it is one of the biggest or i don't know it might be the biggest independent film festival in the united states and it's hosted by the sundance institute it takes place every january over the course of 10 days in park city and salt lake city utah and also the sundance resort in provo utah which is not by park city or salt lake fyi not only does it showcase all of the these different types of films but it also has like panels and exhibits and parties discussions special live music events it's just a really cool experience the festival is split up into two halves and the first half of 2020 is going to take place Thursday January 23rd through Tuesday January 28th and then the second half is Wednesday January 29th through Sunday February 2nd and so for a lot of people if you purchase like some sort of package or pass it's usually only for the first half or the second half as far as which one is better the first or the second half it really just matters on like what your priorities are for attending this festival is it just to see films or are you looking for like more of an experience the first half of the festival is definitely popping it's like super crazy that's of course when all of these films are premiering for the first time and because of that all of the filmmakers directors cinematographers famous actors like all of these people are here at the festival during this time and so that's when there's like more stuff there's like q a's at the end of the screenings and then like these panels with the different actors and filmmakers so if you're interested in the Q&A's by like the people who actually made the film the first half is better all the films that are playing the first week are going to be playing the second week so if you're just going for films you're gonna see the exact same ones whether you go the first or second week there are so many different types of films there are so many films playing in general you can learn all about the different types of film the different categories on their website along with all the films that are playing in the category for 2020 or a different year if you're watching this a different time so yeah on the website and list them all u.s dramatic competition u.s documentary competition world cinema dramatic competition world cinema documentary competition premieres documentary premieres spotlight next midnight midnight is one of my favorite i think indie episodic shorts so you can see all the information about the categories on the website under program. It'll bring up the page that says festival program. You can click on it and it'll bring up the different films that are being played. Um, click on them individually again and it'll show you all of the information you might want to know. Details about the film and the filmmaker, the director, and it'll also already show you where it's playing like the days and times. On the same page for festival program you can click on schedule and it shows this really cool overlapping version of the schedule with really cool filter features. If you pick a day, it shows you all of the screenings for all of the theaters for all of the venues. And it's, as you can see, it is a lot. There is so much going on. I think I already mentioned, it is just crazy like how much stuff is going on. But say you only care about Park City screenings, you can filter it for only Park City theaters. You can filter it by all the different categories. It's just, it's very interactive. When you're making your own schedule, this is very helpful. So that was the interactive schedule, but also you can see on the festival program page, it has a printable program that you can print if you want. And then everything is available on the app. So like the schedule, all the information you need to know about the different types of categories and all the different films in those categories like everything that is on the website will also be on the app and then when you go to pick up like your passes your packages and stuff they give you this giant book which is all of that information that is on the website for every category every single movie literally exactly what the website looks like they also give you this smaller, way more manageable, way more helpful book. Everything is color-coded, so last year everything in Park City was pink, 
um, everything in Salt Lake City was yellow. And looking at this new schedule, I can see that Salt Lake City is still yellow, but Park City is now orange and Resort is green. And so like they've changed it, but same concept, your schedule is color coded and you can find it on the website, in the app or in this little booklet they're gonna hand out. It really is a lot of information to take in, but I think they organize it very well. So along the top, each column from top to bottom, that area is per theater. So everything in that column is playing at that specific theater that is labeled on top, and then the show times are on the left. At the top under each theater, it will tell you how many seats that theater holds, and that information will be valuable for you to know if you're trying to do wait lists. Like if a showing is full and it only seats 200 and something people, like do you wanna go all the way to the other side of Park City to stand in this wait list line? When the theater is like really, really small, like your chances just aren't that great to get in. So keep that in mind when you're like looking at these and thinking about which ones you should hit up on wait lists. So that's the schedule. And also in this little booklet they handed out, there are maps. So a physical copy of the map for all the different like shuttle stops. This one is just of the Park City Main Street area, which is where all like the venues and fun stuff are. If you live in Utah, if you live in Salt Lake City or Park City, you probably already know that there are free showings. You will find when they are on the schedule, they don't announce which movie it's gonna be until like right before, but they'll send you like updates and notifications on the app. So if you have your push notifications turned on, it'll like tell you. But also if you just got like a smaller ticket package or if you have free time, like might as well hit up the free showing. And then on the last day of the festival, so like the second half is when they do the award winners. The categories that you see are competitions, are the ones that are judged, and the ones that get voted the best are the award winners, obviously, and those all get played on the last day, which is gonna be Sunday, February 2nd, separate from tickets, separate from attending films. I did mention there's all this other stuff to do at the film festival, especially during the first week, so like the panels, live music events, discussions, things like that, and you do need a credential to attend most of that stuff. This is what a credential looks like. Um, it depends on who you are, on what you got. It might have your picture. This had my real name and I put cotton candy. So you need this if you want to attend the non-film venues. Yeah. There are so many different panels going on, especially the first half, and they're really, really cool. These panels are obviously a lot smaller than like the film screening venues. So if you want to go to a panel, get there very, 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 very early because the lines get really long to get in really fast. That was probably like the big biggest lesson I learned going to Sundance. Like I ended up getting there late to most of the things I wanted to do. I didn't get into most of the panels I wanted to get into because I didn't get there early enough and the line just was like super long and crazy and yeah. But I did get to see some pretty dang cool ones still and I got to attend two YouTube panels which was really fun. If you're going to Sundance, you have to see at least a couple panels. You definitely have to check out some of the different exhibits they have. They're really fun, unique experiences. You can find more information about the New Frontier exhibits and stuff from this year for 2020 on their website, just like you would find information on any of the films and stuff. And all of the times for the exhibits will be on the schedule also. So there's like blocks. And this is one of the things I had to learn is that you still needed like tickets or to reserve a spot for these different time slots. And so like we had to keep trying to get on wait lists just to attend these exhibits. And I unfortunately didn't get to go to any because they filled up really fast. If I would have known, I would have like gotten a ticket for it or something. I don't know. Live and learn. The next time I go to Sundance, I'm going to be way better at it. I did already mention like Q&As during the first half, especially a bunch of the filmmakers, like the director, cinematographer, the actors will be there for the first few showings of their films. And it's really cool to hear them like talk about the film, what it was like to work on it, what was their vision, things like that. And then they also do Q&As. Like getting to see all these films are an amazing enough experience, but getting to see inside the minds of the filmmakers, I think that's one of the funnest things about the festival. And kind of the suckiest part about going to the second half is that most filmmakers don't don't stick around to do Q and A's for their showings during the second half. In addition to the films that are awarded the best films by the judges of Sundance, they actually also have these audience awards. So if you go to these different screenings, you can actually vote for your favorite films to contribute to that voted audience award. Well, I mean, the way it works is they give you like a little paper and you rank one, two, three, and four stars. And obviously that overall rating at the end when they count it all up is how they determine the audience award winners. Super fun to be a part of that. I got to participate in voting for quite a few. I did already mention the location of the Sundance Film Festival take place in Salt Lake City, Park City, and at the Sundance Resort. 
yeah. These locations are not close together at all. Like if you're coming to Sundance for the first time and you have no idea what to expect, Salt Lake City and Park City are very, very far. It could be like a 30 minute to a 75 minute drive just to go between the two depending on when you're going. They are cities, so there's going to be time when traffic is worse, like in the morning for rush hour and then in the mid evening during rush hour when locals are leaving work to go home on the days that aren't the weekend. So keep that in mind when you're making your schedule. My advice is to stick to one city per day. Or like, I guess if you're staying in Salt Lake City, you can start your day with a Salt Lake City showing and then go to Park City for the rest of the day, but you're not going to be able to go to one in Salt Lake, go to one in Park City and come back. Like you could, but it's just gonna be so stressful because it takes so much longer to get around than you would anticipate. As you can see on the festival schedule, on the festival program, there are a lot of theaters. So I have pictures for all of the theaters if you're going so you know what they look like ahead of time. You can skip to the end if you want to. If not, enjoy this super cute slideshow. For the Park City theaters, this is the Eccles Theater, Egyptian Theater, the Holiday Village Cinema, the Library Center Theater, the Mark Theater, the Park Avenue Theater, which is inside the Doubletree Hilton Hotel. This is the Ray Theater, which is where you will find the box at the Ray and the New Frontier at the Ray. This is Redstone Cinema, and this is the Temple Theater. For Salt Lake City, this is the Broadway Center Cinema. The Grand Theater is actually inside of Salt Lake Community College. This is the Rose Wagner Center. The Salt Lake City Library has a theater. And this is the Tower Theater. The official festival map is actually built into Google Maps. It's a Google Map map, yeah. <laughs> you can access it on the website to see what I'm talking about. It's very convenient that they do it this way because of GPS. You can pull it up on the app on your phone. Everything is labeled with icons. You can see what the icons mean on their website. On the left side, I would definitely recommend getting on the website and kind of familiarizing yourself with it because it's just good to be prepared and know as much as you can ahead of time because when you get there, it's gonna be like super crazy and just the more prepared you are, the better you're gonna feel when you're there and then like this map is obviously gonna be really small on your phone so it might be good just to get on the website and look at it like the bigger picture the map shows you everything the theaters the venues box offices where to park where the official parking spots are and the shuttle stops which are really really important because especially for Park City that's just how you're gonna have to get around you're not really gonna be able to drive places and the venues are a lot farther than you would think like you cannot walk from one to the other most of the time this little booklet that they hand out it does have maps where you can see the different venues and then the different routes. Everything they do is color coded. It's very convenient. The different theaters and locations, the shuttle stops, they have their wayfinding system thing down. There are also these large physical maps at each of the bus stops. And then there are volunteers at each of these stops that'll tell you exactly which shuttle to get on if you tell them where you need to go. They honestly just make it so easy, you guys. I know if it's your first time going, it may be a little scary and overwhelming because there are so many venues and theaters. There are so many different shuttle stops and routes. Like it's a lot to take in and to try and figure out, but they really do their best to make it quite easy. And after your first day or so there, you'll definitely get the hang of it. Don't forget that the map with all the shuttle routes and stops are on the app as well. There really isn't room for parking at like any of the theaters and there's definitely no parking around Main Street. Park City is very small and it's a residential area and there's literally nowhere to park. So what you're going to want to do depending on where you're staying, like I live in Salt Lake City so I had to drive to Park City every day, drop my car off at one of the park and rides to get on one of the shuttles to take me to the festival area and then I use the shuttles there to get around the festival. So if you're coming from a different area, you can park at these park and rides. Um, the parking, like I said, is labeled on this Google map for you. A parking lot right off of the I-80 freeway called Ecker Hill Park and Ride. That is where I was. And there are a few different shuttles that stop there. If you do need to drive to Park City, park at one of those park and rides. You can take ride shares around Park City through like Lyft or Uber, but these venues, there isn't a lot of space like in front of them. It's not easy for the Ubers to get around. It's just such a small congested area. Like you're going to probably just get stuck in traffic a lot. It's gonna just delay you. For Salt Lake City, it is different because there's parking at all of the theaters, which is cool, but a lot of it is like structured or metered parking. So you do have to pay for parking for basically all of the theaters. So just be prepared for that. There are going to be a few theaters, maybe closer to residential areas where you can like park 
work in residential areas, but those fill up really fast. So don't count on that. You're probably gonna have to do some walking. The third location of the festival, the Sundance Mountain Resort, there is free parking there. The Salt Lake City venues are not close together at all for the most part. Like you cannot walk from one to the other. You will have to drive to get to the different venues or you could use like a public transportation bus. You can do ride shares like Uber or Lyft and I think it would actually be pretty cheap because even though they're far away from each other as in the way that you can't walk to them easily, the drive between them isn't that bad and I don't think it would cost more than like, I don't know, like five, between five and ten dollars. Make sure that you have both Uber and Lyft downloaded because I don't know why, but sometimes their prices to a place are drastically different in cost. So it's worth it to always check both apps. I've continuously mentioned, I think that Main Street and Park City is like the recreational and social hub for Sundance in the area. That's where all the lounges and venues are there. And there are not a lot of places to eat in that area. There are a few expensive restaurants and like these bars that have like your typical bar food, but they're always is super duper full. Well, they're only full during the first half. Like that's when I said everything is like really crazy, right? And then the second half, everything is empty. Well, if you're going to the first half of Sundance, all of those food places, like they're just super duper crowded and you can't get food there. Some of the lounges will have like little snacks. A lot of them will have like coffee and hot chocolate, sometimes donuts, candy, things like that. Like not real food. Some of the panels will have food, but don't expect them to because you honestly never know which one. So you don't want to plan on eating at a panel and then not having food and then you end up going hours without eating. Some of them do have food and it's really bougie and it's really cool, but not all of them do. So don't expect that. A lot of the private parties and special events will have food, but the thing is for those, you do have to RSVP ahead of time. There are a couple fast food places by the Kimball Junction Transit Center, which you can take one of the shuttles to from Main Street, but it is actually kind of far. And so it's kind of like out of your way to go there. There's also a fresh market grocery store by the Ray Theater. So check for that. That shuttle stop. That's basically where I bought food and snacks the whole time because there was literally like nowhere else for you to buy stuff. There is a Starbucks inside that fresh market and then there's also another Starbucks like right in front of it outside and Starbucks sells food like pastries and stuff so. Most of the theaters and park cities do have concessions, so it's like your typical movie theater-like food, which isn't like real food. Basically what I'm saying is there's very, very sparse options for eating in Park City, and so to be prepared for that, make sure you bring like bagged lunches or snacks and stuff like that. Salt Lake City, on the other hand, has plenty of places to eat, especially at the venues that are more centrally located to the downtown area. There's tons of fast food and restaurants and all of the theaters, except for I think the Salt Lake City Library, have concessions, so it's really Really, really nice. Their waitlist system is really good, I think, but it was really confusing and really hard to get a hang of at first. It's all done through the app. Waitlist opens a couple hours before the showing, so you'll open up the app for that showing. There's even a little countdown to when it opens, and you have to be quick because it really does fill up super duper fast. Like when I wanted to see Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, I think that's what it's called. That was like the longest name ever. Anyways, I was trying to get in to see that at the Eccles Theater, and there was like 400 waitlist spots, and they all filled up immediately. But it's good that you do that, like you don't have to physically go wait in line to see if you get in. Like if you don't get in on this wait list, then don't even like try to go. If you do get on the wait list for a screening, you do have to be there like 30 minutes before the showtime. And if you're not there 30 minutes before, you forfeit your wait in the wait list line. Like I'm not even kidding. If you get there like a minute late from whatever it says, like the time you have to be there, like you forfeit it. And we learned that the hard way. We finally got on the wait list for one and then we were like a minute late and did not get into the movie because we had forfeited our spot and yeah so many lessons learned like the first two days of Sundance man it was rough the lodges are super duper fun they're all decorated and I think I mentioned some of them have snacks and different things to do some of them have live music it's really really fun and again like the first half of Sundance is just more fun like the lodges are more lively and on the second weekend the same lodges they just like don't have anything going on the restrooms or the toilets for anyone coming um, from Europe are very easy to find all of the theater venues Venues do have restrooms, toilets. If you're in Park City, you can use the ones in the Fresh Market grocery store if you have to. And then there's also a Starbucks, like I said, in front of that same block that the Fresh Market is on that you can also use their restroom. They do have security that searches you every time you go into a screening. They'll ask you to like open up your jacket so they can see inside and then they'll check your bags. Sundance obviously takes place in Utah in the middle of winter and especially Park City is freezing. Inside of the theaters, the lodges and the venues, it may be warm 
warm, but a lot of the times you're outside in the cold, waiting in lines, traveling between the different venues, so it's important to dress very warm. So far here in Utah, it is a very, very cold winter. Today, right now, as I am shooting this video in Park City, it is nine degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 13 degrees Celsius, so it is very cold, and at the end of January, who knows, it may be even colder. So be prepared for that. That is definitely colder than when I attended Sundance. And if it starts snowing, oh my God, don't get me started. <laughs> wear a lot of layers, have a good coat. I think I wear like four layers every day when I went. And like I said, it wasn't even as cold last Sundance as it is this year, so yeah, be prepared. You can always take off some of your layers when you get inside the theaters and menus. Even if it is not snowing during the festival, the sidewalks and streets may still be very icy or wet, so it's very, very important for you to wear snow boots. Not regular boots, not regular shoes, snow boots. Or you're gonna slip and fall and it's gonna suck, and if you're not wearing like good quality boots, your feet are gonna get soaking wet and that's not fun either. You need a good pair of gloves. I think these ones I used, they're like mini ones, right? There are so many different kinds. I like them because, you know, you have to be on your phone a lot when you're looking at like the schedule and navigating through the different shuttle stops. So it's nice to take this off. There's also the ones that are gloves and like the little fingers. They allow you to still use your touch screen. Um, this one has this little thing so I can still use it. Um, yeah, these ones are still my favorite. So yeah, essential items to bring with you to Sundance aside from all the things you have to wear to dress warm like the gloves, the shoes, good coat layers, all that good stuff. I would say you definitely need to bring snacks and or boxed lunches, bagged lunches, especially if you're gonna be in Park City because again, the food options can be very sparse there. Another essential item I would consider bringing is lotion. I did emphasize that it's important to have gloves because it is freaking freezing. Even with wearing gloves, Utah is so cold and so dry that you'll start getting like cuts all over your hands and it sucks. So definitely I would say bring lotion. Also bring hand sanitizer because there are literally so many people at Sundance. You're around all of these germs. Very good investment to invest in hand sanitizer to help prevent you from getting sick from catching all these germs. You can actually do this two for one thing. Thing, you can find these hand sanitizers that are also lotion and then like boom strategic planning more bang for your buck You're gonna want to bring a portable charger or a power bank to charge your phone with bring your cord But there aren't really gonna be any places for you to plug in your phone to charge it So that's why you need to bring this portable power bank charge So you could just charge your phone wherever you are one thing you don't have to worry about is water Like you can bring your own water bottle, but they do hand out these Sundance water bottles They have these water coolers at every venue and every waitlist line. I had a Sundance water bottle and I lost it. I would definitely recommend bringing like a bag or a backpack with you. You're gonna want a way to carry water and carry like excess things that you're taking on and off. Like when you're going in and out of venues, it might get really hot. So you'll wanna take stuff off and you don't wanna just be holding everything. You can put your lotion, hand sanitizer, charging cord, wallet, like everything, especially like the first half, these lodges and venues hand out like little items to have. So then you start collecting all this free stuff and it, yeah, it's just nice to have some sort of bag with you. If you're not used to carrying like a purse or a backpack or something, it would be a good investment just for this event. I think that might be it. I don't know. This was like a lot of information to cram in one video, but yeah, I think that's it. Like I said, I am a music festival vlogger. This is the first time I've done a guide slash tip video for a film festival, but since I went to Sundance, it was my natural instinct to take notes to help people out because yeah, there's like literally no helpful tip videos on YouTube right now. Like when I was looking for help, I couldn't find any. Now there will be an informational tip video. If you found this video helpful, it would mean a lot to me if you would give it a like and and I will post the links to my Sundance Film Festival 2019 vlogs in the description in case you want to check them out and see what it was like to attend the festival from my perspective. I would also love for you to check out the other videos on my channel. The music festivals I go to all over the world are super duper cool and I would love to introduce you to them. Thank you for watching this video and if you're going to Sundance, I hope you have the best time ever. Until next time, peace out Girl Scouts.